Now we had also made mention about the possibility of looking at things in spherical coordinates. And there's a very nice relationship between this z rotation, this angular momentum in the z direction, and in fact spherical coordinates. So let's consider once again, so we're going to look in here now in spherical coordinates, and let's consider once again our infinitesimal rotation operator about the z-axis and now let's apply this to a function but let's express our function in those polar coordinates of r theta and phi so i had better make a diagram over here for conventional spherical coordinates so once again i have my properly right hand coordinate system x y z and in spherical coordinates the idea is i take any point up here and then i represent it by its distance r from the origin the angle that this vector makes with respect to the z-axis is what i call theta and finally the projection of my point as it goes down into the xy plane i look at where that projection hits and the angle that that makes with respect to my x-axis that is the angle that we call phi so that is my standard spherical coordinate system if I think about the action of my rotation operator here, you will notice that as I rotate my coordinate axes, x and y, there's no change in my z-coordinate, and there's also no change in the radius, the distance I am from the origin. As I rotate things, all that happens is that this point then would move around in a circle, something along these lines here. So once again, there's no change in r. Also notice, as I rotate around the z-axis, this cone that I'm tracing out also makes no change in the angle theta. The only possible changes, really, are in where this projection of my point in the xyz plane, where it lands in the, x, in the xy plane, I'm sorry, and what the angle it is that it makes with respect to my x-axis. So all of the possible changes really are in phi. To, um, again, get a good handle on that, that what happens to that angle, because it really is all happening in the xy plane, I can go back to my original diagram where I considered rotations. So the idea is, we could imagine, for example, starting once again at this point here that was along the x-axis. And the interesting thing for this point is that in the xy coordinate system, when I'm not going to my primed coordinate system, in that xy coordinate system, my angle, of course, would have been zero because I'm right on my x-axis. But if I look at it in my primed coordinate system, that particular point now is no longer on the x prime axis. Rather, it's off by an angle equal to the rotation angle that I've applied to my coordinates. In this case, this would be epsilon. But notice it's in the opposite clockwise direction from x prime. It's not in the positive counterclockwise direction. It's in the clockwise direction. So all of these angles relative to this x prime axis are now decreased by the amount of the rotation. They are decreased by epsilon. So if I want to be a little bit more mathematical about this, this rotation gives me f now in the primed spherical coordinate system. And as we had commented, when I rotate my coordinate system around, it doesn't change my radius. It, and if I'm rotating around the z-axis, which I am, it doesn't change the angle theta. It only changes this angle phi. So r prime is actually equal to r. Theta prime equals theta, but phi prime is being decreased, relatively speaking, by the amount of my rotation because I'm rotating my coordinates around and that decreases the angles that I have relative to my coordinate system. Now, once again, we can express this function back in terms of the original coordinates, r, theta, and phi minus epsilon. And for a small change epsilon, we can determine what the, this operation does to my function f because, once again, I can do a Taylor series expansion where the zeroth order term is just my function. The first order terms only enter on this third coordinate. There are no changes in r and theta. And we know how f changes with respect to the third coordinate. That's called partial f with respect with respect to phi, and the amount of change in that coordinate, of course, is just minus epsilon. So from this, immediately then, we can read off what this z rotation operator does. 
And for these infinitesimal rotations, what it does to my oop, original function, so I guess I'll write it in terms of its action on a function f, that would equal just the original function back again. So that will be a 1 applied to f. Then the remaining pieces is minus then epsilon multiplying the angular derivative with respect to phi of my function, which I've factored out. Now, here is the very interesting thing. This tells me that the rotation operator is equal to 1 minus epsilon d by d phi. But I had previously learned that it is also equal to, if I'm rotating around z, of course, 1 minus i times the corresponding angular momentum. So it's 1 minus i, the angular momentum about the z direction, times the amount of rotation divided by h bar. And if these two quantities are equal, I can immediately uh, determine then that, well, the ones will cancel, the minus signs will cancel, the epsilons will cancel, and I learn that d by d phi must therefore equal what's left over when I've gotten rid of the i and the epsilon. I'm, I'm sorry, not the i. I've gotten rid of the epsilon, um, and I'm keeping the uh, lz i and h bar. So it'll be i over h bar times lz operator. So I've learned now an alternate expression, actually, for my LZ operator, that LZ written in spherical coordinates is just h bar divided by i. So it feels a lot like the momentum operator that we're used to. But now the derivative is with respect to an angular coordinate because it's actually angular momentum. And this is a, an expression then that we could make use of, of course, if we're ever working in spherical coordinates. An interesting lesson from this result, by the way, is notice that it has no effect on the radio on the other coordinates, no effect on, in particular, the radial coordinate. And that's simply because we are talking about rotations. And rotations never really change the radius at all. So we could work out the angular momentum in x and y in terms of the uh, angles that are involved. And if we were to do that, we would learn it would have nothing to do with r. The other angular momentum operators also only act on angles. So there's no effect on r, only on angles. Angles. And the same thing would true, hold true uh, if, in this latter statement for any particular uh, one of my l, x, y, or z. But I have a nice particular expression for l, z. Very good.